Hello and welcome to Nithrania YouTube channel. My name is Branislav Berec and you're watching another episode of the Game in a Micro Nutshell series which is designed for explaining the board game rules in a very condensed format. In this video we're going to learn how to play Oath Chronicles of the Empire and this video would be for you if you already know how to play the game but you haven't played in a quite some time and you need to refresh the rules or if you are going to play for the first time but with someone who already knows how to play and how to run the game. Because in this video I'm going to explain all the rules you need to know to play the game, to play the game well and to win the game. But I'm going to skip all kinds of administration rules which can be easily explained over the course of the game without having any impact on the winning strategy or tactics. So let's get started. The game board is a map of some historical fantasy empire and it has three regions. Cradle, Provinces and Hinterland. The Cradle region has two sides, Plains is already face up, the other one is face down, Provinces have three sides, Mountain and two face down sides and Hinterland also has three sides. Each side on the map may also contain additional cards and those cards may represent various events, places or people at those sides and they can also contain relics. Now each player is represented by this big pawn and essentially each player is a powerful character in the empire. One player plays the game as the chancellor of that empire, other players are exiles. Your player board represents your wealth, you will have some warbands traveling with you, you may have some secret tokens, those are secrets you know and these coins, these favor tokens represent the favor of the people of the empire. It's your influence in the empire you can spend. In addition to that you will have some advisors who also travel together with you. In each game Chancellor is bound by a certain oath. In the first game for example is to keep the supremacy which means that the Chancellor promised to the people of the empire that he will have the warbands in most sides in the empire. Having the warband or warbands at a site means that that player controls and rules that site. That's why Chancellor starts the game as the Oath Keeper. However, all the exile players in the game are trying to prevent the Chancellor from reaching that goal. So in that first game they will try to make him lose that supremacy and they want to be the rulers of the sites. So basically they want to have that supremacy. Now, in order to prevent that, the Chancellor may persuade some of the other players in the game to join him. So he may persuade some of the exile players to become the citizens of the Empire and protect the Empire, which means the citizens will help Chancellor to regain the supremacy. But in that case, the citizen must dethrone Chancellor in a peaceful way. So if the citizen player wants to win the game, they must become the successor of the Chancellor and they must fulfill the goal which is at the bottom of this goal reference card. In this example they have to have more relics than the Chancellor. The citizen player must still keep the oath together with the Chancellor but he can show to the people of the Empire that not only he can keep that oath in the same way as the Chancellor but he can also have more relics and so he is better than the Chancellor and he can become his successor. To counter that strategy, exiles have another way how to win the game. They can present a new vision to the people of the empire and there are four visions that are a winning condition in the game. In this example if this player holds the people's favor banner, that player would win the game. So if that player persuades the denizens of the empire that he will gain their favor and he will never lose that favor, he will win the game. The Oath of the Supremacy is no longer important to the people of the Empire, they now have the new vision, they want to have the ruler who has their favor. The game of Oath is played in rounds and there are maximum 8 rounds in the game. And in each round each player takes one turn starting with the Chancellor and then continuing in a clockwise direction. On your turn you will go through three phases. First one is the wake phase 
It's an administration and upkeep phase. The second phase is the act phase in which you will use your supply to take these major actions and some minor actions. Finally, the third phase is the rest phase. Again, it's another administration and cleanup phase. The second phase is the act phase. In this phase, you may take any number of these major actions. You can take them in any order you want. You can even take the same action more than once. And if the action costs some supply, for each supply, move the supply marker one space to the right in the direction of these arrows. With a search action, you will add a new card to the game, either to the Empire or as one of your advisors. You may draw three cards, either from the world deck or from the discard pile in the region where you have your pawn. You may not draw the cards from both decks. After drawing the cards, secretly look at those cards and discard all of them but one. Now, based on the position of your pawn, you will always discard the cards to the next region. So in this example, you will discard the cards to the discard pile in the provinces. Then you have four options what to do with the card you keep. First one is to place the card face up to the side where you have the pawn. Then Look at the suit symbol of that card and immediately gain one favor from the suit bank of the same symbol. Place that favor token on your player board. The second option is to play that card face up as one of your advisors. If you play the card face up and the card has this tree symbol, it must be placed to the side. If you play the card face up and card has this person symbol, it must be placed as one of your advisors. In addition, this chain symbol above that person symbol indicates that the card is locked, which means it cannot be discarded, it cannot be moved elsewhere unless explicitly stated by some game effect. The third option is to play the card face down to your advisors. You may flip that card face up anytime later on your turn or on your subsequent turns. And the last option is to simply discard the card. Again, if you have the pawn here, you discard the card to the next region. Your advisors are always moving with your pawn and only you can use their special abilities. You can have maximum three advisors face up or face down. When you play the fourth advisor, you must discard one of your existing ones unless the advisor is locked. And in fact, this is the only option how to discard one of your face up advisors and replace it with a new card. There are five vision cards in the game with this bag, four true visions and one of them is a conspiracy. When you draw the vision card, you may either place it face down to your advisors or you can discard it. Only the exile players can play the true vision card face up on their player board. This is revealed vision and this true vision doesn't count as the advisor. Any player can play the conspiracy vision card face up if that player fulfills the condition on the card. This conspiracy is not a winning condition. It just allows you to steal a banner or a relic from another player. The second action is the master action, which is basically the recruit action. You can only do that at the site where you have your pawn. This is called your site. And you will have to spend your favor to influence the people at that site to join your war bets. So to do that, you have to spend one supply. You have to take one of your favor token and place it on any empty card at your site. And then you can take two warbands from your personal supply and add them to the warbands on your player board. The next action is the trade action. First you have to spend one supply and then you have two options. You can either share one of your secrets with the denizens at your site and in return you will gain some favor or vice versa. You can spend some favor, you can use your influence to learn some new secrets from the local denizens. So when you choose the first option, you have to take one of your secret tokens and again, place it on an empty card at your site. 
then immediately gain one favor from the favor bank with the same suit as the suit symbol on the card where you place that secret. For each matching advisor of the same suit, you would gain one additional favor token. If you choose the second option, this time you have to take two favor tokens and place them on an empty card at your site, and now you can learn new secrets from those people there. Again, for each matching advisor, you will get one new secret. Place those secret tokens on your player board. With the recover action, you have two options. You can either recover the relic, which is at your side. In this example, we have the red player's turn. Or you can recover any banner, even your own one. First, you have to pay one supply. And then, if you want to recover the relic, the costs are indicated in the bottom right corner of the side card. In this example, red player has to burn two favor tokens. Burning the favor tokens means that the red player has to return two favor tokens to the general supply. Then you can take the relic and place it face up next to your player board. To recover the banner of the people's favor, you have to place more favor tokens on it than it has already. In this example, you have to place four or more favor tokens on it. Apart from adding to many victory goals, the banner also has an ability which you can use when you take the search action. The banner of the darkest secret also adds to some victory goals, however learning this darkest secret is not so easy. You have to find at least one denizen card at the site where the current holder has their pawn, and that denizen must steal it from one of the advisors of the current holder. But that denizen will not do it if they're friends with the advisors of the current holders, so if their suits match. And so you have to find a denizen whose suit doesn't match the suit of any of those advisors. To recover the banner, you have to place more secret tokens on it than it has already. With the move action, you can move your pawn to a different site, either in the same region or in any different regions. Travel costs are indicated in these black bars right below the name of the region. And for example, in the Cradle region, if you want to move to another site in the same region, so here, you have to pay one supply. If you want to move with your pawn to any site in the provinces region, you have to pay this middle value, so two supply. And if you want to move your pawn to any site in the hinterland region, you have to pay four supply. When you move to a site which is face down, Flip it face up and resolve any effects in the top left corner. With the campaign action, you can attack one opponent at your site, and you can attack their sites, you can attack their relics, banners, favor, their pawn, you choose. First, the attacker, in our example the yellow player, must choose one opponent from their site. It can be a player who has a pawn there, or the player who rules that site. If no one rules that site, the attacking player may still attack that site, which is considered to be ruled by the bandits. After choosing the defender, let's say it's going to be the purple player, the chancellor, choose any number of targets of that player. You can target any site they rule anywhere on the map, and only if the defender has the pawn at your site, you can also target their banners and relics, and you can target their pawn and favor. In the next step, both players will build their dice pools. The attacker gains number of dice equal to the number of warbands on their player board. So here it would be eight dice. Then each target you choose has this blue defense dice symbol in a top right hand corner. So each side you declare as the target adds one blue die to the defense dice pool. The same applies to relics and banners, each of them has a symbol in a top right corner. Then if the defender holds this Oathkeeper title, that adds one additional blue die to the dice pool. And only if the attacker would target the pawn itself, as indicated here, the defender would add two additional blue dice to the dice pool. Then both players may use the battle plans, those are the cards with this crown icon with the campaign symbol inside. These are special cards only used during the campaigns. 
and both players may use any battle plans they roll, so either the battle plans in the advisor's area or cards at any side ruled by that player. The attacker chooses the battle plans first, they can use any battle plans they rule with the red color or with this gradient color, the defending player can use any battle plans they rule with the blue color or again with the gradient. Some battle plans also have the cost you need to pay to take that effect, and since these battle plans are special cards, they also break another rule, you can pay for those effects even though that card is not empty. Also, if applicable, don't forget to use the powers of sides targeted by the attacker. Now it's time to roll the dice. Defending player rolls first. Each shield you roll adds 1 to the defense value, so here the base value is 3. This symbol multiplies that value, so it is 6. And if you roll more than one multiplier, continue multiplying, so this would be 3 times 2 is 6, times 2 would be 12. Then each warband on the targeted sides also adds 1 to the defense value. If you target the site with the opponent's pawn, or if the opponent's pawn is directly at your site, the defender also adds the warbands on their player board to the defense value. Now the attacker rolls the dice. Each sword, one full sword, adds 1 to the attack value. Each pair of hollow swords also add 1 to the attack value. If there's only one hollow sword, that adds 0. And each skull symbol means that the attacking player must kill one of their warbands and place them in their personal reserve. Now, only the attacking player may continue killing their warbands, and for each warband they kill from their player board, they add one more to the attack value. Only if the attack value is greater than the defense value, the attacker wins the campaign. In case of a tie, the defender wins. Then the defeated player kills half of the warbands that added to the defense. That includes warbands from the attacked sides, and it may also include warbands from their player board. And the remaining warbands are moved back to the player board. If the attacker loses the battle, they have to kill half of the warbands from their player board. Then, if the attacker wins the battle, they may place warbands from their player board to the newly conquered sites. And if you decide to leave some of those sites empty, those sites will be ruled by bandits. In addition to the major actions, any time on your turn you can also use minor action. They don't cost any supply. Those minor actions are listed over here. But in a nutshell, if you have a face down advisor, you can place that card face up using the standard rules. You may use the powers on the cards at sites you rule, even if you don't have your pawn there. If you have any denizen cards or relics with this action keyword, you can use those actions, although sometimes you may need to pay some costs. You may always speak at the relics at your site. And you can always add any number of warbands from your player board to your site if you rule that site. And if you wish so, you can remove any number of warbands from your site, except the last one, and return those removed warbands back to your player board. If you hold this Grand Scepter, you may offer citizenship to any exile player. You must offer to give them one relic from this reliquary, and you may negotiate any binding exchange of secret tokens or favor tokens, banners, relics, and so on. If the exile player accepts the citizenship, then they must flip their player board, replace the warbands with the purple warbands, discard any revealed vision if there was any, flip the Oathkeeper title if the exile player would have it, and that player would immediately end their turn. If you hold the Grand Scepter relic, you can also do the opposite. You can exile the citizen. In order to do that, you must give them 5 favor tokens, then the exiled player flips their player board, the supply marker is placed in the leftmost space, and all the warbands are replaced with the warbands of that player's color. There may be situations when you as the citizen would like to exile yourself, and you can do that if you don't hold the Grand Scepter relic. Rest phase is another administration cleanup phase. First, return any favor tokens from the denizen and edifices cards to their matching favor banks. However, the secrets are returned back to your player board. 
then refresh your supply based on the number of warbands in your personal supply. In this situation the Chancellor has 9 warbands here, so the supply marker would go to this space, however this one unspent supply will be added, so the supply marker will be moved to this space. The game can end in 4 different ways. First, the Exile player can win the game if they have this Usurper title at the start of the Wake phase. Second, the Exile player can win the game if they have any revealed vision, they meet the conditions on that vision card, they win the game at the start of the Wake phase. Then, if the Chancellor or the Citizen have the Oathkeeper title, the game can end at the end of the 5th, 6th or 7th round. Roll this purple die at the end of those rounds, and if you would roll 6 at the end of the 5th round, 5 or 6 at the end of the 6th round, and 3, 4, 5, 6 at the end of the 7th round, the game would end. If not, simply proceed to the next round. If the game ends and the Chancellor has the Oathkeeper title, Chancellor wins the game. However, if the Chancellor would win because he has the Oathkeeper title, but there is a citizen who fulfills this successor goal, then this citizen player is the winner. And finally, basically the game will always end at the end of the 8th round. And now check for the victory in this exact order. First, if the Chancellor has the Oathkeeper title, the Chancellor wins the game unless there is a citizen who meets the successor goal, in that case the citizen wins the game. Second, if any exiled player has the Usurper title, that player wins the game. If not, if any exiled player has the vision, revealed vision, and fulfills the condition of that vision, he wins the game. And fourth, if the exiled player has the Oathkeeper title, but not the Usurper title, or if that player has a revealed vision, but doesn't meet the condition of that vision, but again, it's the Chancellor's victory or the Citizen's victory if that Citizen meets the successor goal. So that was Oath Chronicles of the Empire in a micro nutshell format. I hope it was useful and uh, it was useful in, in such a condensed format. If you like the series, please subscribe. You can even support the channel on the Patreon page. You've been watching Game in a Micro Nutshell. My name is Branislav Berec and hope to see you next time.